Welcome. Glad to see you again. I'm Dr. Ken Piper, and this is a teaching and learning series about the wonders of the human body, um, mine and yours and everyone. This particular uh, session is part two, uh, titled The Senses of Awareness. In part one, we looked at survival senses various sorts that have kept us alive the last million years and more. Uh, today we're going to look at other senses, um, again, senses of the awareness of being alive, this time focusing on how we feel the world and how we move in the world. Uh, so feeling and moving uh, are pretty complex, a lot of integration, a lot of systems linking to each other um, and to feel the world we really have to be responsive to touch and pressure to heat and cold vibration pain and itching um, as I mentioned in part one when we talk about sensing systems um, there's going to be an energy from the outside world we need specific receptors to capture that energy. These receptors have to change that stimulus energy into human electrical energy. And that human electrical energy can then be transmitted in the nerve pathways to various parts of the brain where it can be integrated, analyzed, and then perceived by the mind. So in this particular situation, we're going to be looking at um, not, we're not looking at eyes, ears, nose, and throat. That was in part one. We're looking at a lot of receptors that are out in our body. A lot of these receptors are in our, the palms and soles of our arms and legs. Um, a lot of them are around the lips and face. And let's just work together and start with touch. Um, so it, it goes without saying that touch is important. It, it's, it's so much uh, encompassing our relationships in every way. A slight touch on the shoulder changes the conversation no matter what the words are. Touches cross over uh, all the barriers that we artificially put up between each other. Touch is a bonding uh, of formation between all humans, starting with mothers and babies. So there are receptors uh, for touch, tiny little receptors in the skin and they are very sensitive to the movement of tissue. A light touch, a medium touch, a tapping touch, all of those can be uh, perceived as different responses to the same stimuli. These are exquisite receptors. And uh, you know, you've experienced that with your fingertips. Um, you've experienced it uh, uh, in your feet, and, uh, the tiniest tiniest little uh, grit of pebble can feel like it's a rock uh, uh, with constant stimulation. Pressure is a different kind of touch. Pressure is a more sustained touch and we have different receptors for the sense for the energy of pressure. Touch receptors are more near the surface of our body. Pressure receptors are deeper. Uh, which is important. You, you start to feel a touch, but if it gets tighter and tighter, it becomes a different sensation because the pressure receptors respond. It's the same thing with heat and cold. Heat and cold in the skin are receptors, temperature measuring receptors that again can send very discrete messages up the nerve bundles through the spinal cord up into the brain. Uh, we also have receptors for vibration. 
and vibration is not touch and it's not pressure. It is a different kind of sensation. Um, there are some very special receptors to pick up vibration and they're actually carried in some very special nerve bundles coming up the spinal cord. Vibration is especially important down in the feet and that's where the receptors are heaviest and uh, it makes sense uh, down in the feet we want to feel vibration we want to feel the movement beneath us we want to feel if we're in gravel that's sliding or dirt that's too soft or we're slipping so this is very important for survival and to prevent injuries that we can feel that world beneath us this is an example here of uh, our skin just to show you you can see a couple little hairs sticking out to give you a, a, a kind of a size perspective. Different layers of the skin at the top and then down deeper and deeper and all these different sensing organs. Little nerve ends coming up uh, with different types of receptors. And here's just an example. There are dozens of these, but the receptor for touch on the right, the red one, uh, is different than the ones for vision and for hearing and the ones for pressure and vibration and hot and cold are different. Now I will point out second from the right you see the little pitchfork looking structure that is a pain nerve and notice that pain nerves have uh, bare wire endings they call them free nerve endings. There aren't receptors on the ends of those pain nerves they're just bare wires uh, and this is, uh, this is a pretty critical because pain uh, is a very, very powerful part of our um, ways of feeling the world. And pain is complex, it's variable. Um, perception of pain in the brain um, varies from person to person. So it gets complicated. Uh, the same receptor firing from uh, a hot match sends the same message up to the spinal cord, but two different people, their brain can feel it and perceive it in different ways. Um, the, I mean, here's an example. Um, this is just a, a fire, a man sitting next to a fire. Um, messages from the heat of that fire are picked up uh, transmitted up to the brain um, but in the brain there are variations in chemistry the we call neurotransmitters the chemical transmitters that talk neuron to neuron there's differences human to human there's differences in mood and anxiety and depression differences in how attention is being manifest or expectation differences in memory and prior experience so someone with a bad memory of fire is going to expect more trouble, be more anxious, already fire up his nervous system, and may start to be uncomfortable 10 feet from the fire. And someone else could be two feet away and perfectly comfortable. Uh, these uh, receptors uh, are all carried in nerves that join together in the spinal cord and you can see the spinal cord on the right and then these cables run up and down the spinal cord just like a whole bundle of telephone wires wrapped together. We have a protective system very important. Uh, here's a little diagram of um, you or you or me moving a finger too close to the candle uh, and as the finger gets to a critical point pain message will go firing up to the spinal cord but notice this protective mechanism that green uh, nerve carrying the message up uh, fires inside the spinal cord and sends an immediate message back down the blue wire which triggers the muscle and pulls the hand away bang we pull it away so this is a wonderful uh, defense mechanism and protective me mechanism against pain. We don't wait for the pain from the fingertip to go all the way up to the brain and the brain then say, oh, that is really terrible and send a message all the way back down. 
to move the arm, we have what we call a reflex arc, a rapid way to send a protective message and simply get away from this pain. And that's why when we bump ourselves, we immediately grab it with the other hand. Uh, when uh, and pain is even more complex. Uh, pain is a. Uh, there are folks who live in pain chronically. There are folks that, that really only feel occasional pain. We're now finding sensitivities and variabilities in the receptors. It seems there are folks who those bare nerve endings fire too much, too hard, and too long, uh, just as there are folks whose brain perceives different levels of pain. It turns out the little nerve endings are also different. Pain is complex. Um, I've, I've seen a, a video of a woman having her thyroid cut out, and she uh, was laying on a table. They put a couple of acupuncture needles in her wrist and one in her upper arm and uh, asked her how she felt, checked her neck, put a few pins in. She didn't feel anything, and they did the surgery with her totally awake and talking to them. Somehow, the acupuncture message coming up those nerves in the arm produced a blocking effect in the upper spinal cord, and the pain messages from her neck just didn't get past the block. And so her brain did not perceive that anything was happening in the neck. Interestingly, she told them on the video that she could feel them touching her. She could feel pressure, she could feel touch, she could feel temperature, but she didn't feel pain. Um, we used to feel that itching was kind of part of touch, but it turns out we have itch receptors. Um, here's a rash that's itchy. I'm showing this only because, I mean, it's poison ivy. But just a, a little pearl for you. You notice how those uh, blisters are in lines, especially the upper one. If you have an itchy rash and you can see straight lines, it has to be an outside chemical that's causing the reaction. Nothing in the human body is a straight line. All the rashes coming from the inside will have different pattern shapes. It could be circles and ovals, but they won't be straight. The skin is a window to the inner body. But if it's a straight line, it's an outer problem. Humans have some uh, responsiveness to magnetic impulses, uh, some people more than others. Uh, there are folks who have an inner magnetic system, and they actually can, uh, they, you can spin them around and say, OK, walk north, and they know where north is. There are folks who look at a map and then walk through a city and know exactly where they are based on their ability to have kind of like a built-in GPS. And then there are folks that don't have much of this. Um, so this is how we feel the world. Let's just talk a bit about how we move in the world. And to move in the world, we've got to know where our body is. We've got to know which direction we're moving, how fast we're moving. We've got to know are the muscles tight or loose? Are the tendons tight or loose? Are the joints up or down or sideways? And all of this has to be uh, measured at the same time. Body position and direction of movement and acceleration. Where are we? Which way are we moving? And how fast are we moving? is all coming in the domain of our inner ear system, which is called the labyrinth. And if you look at that purpley kind of uh, structures that are tr protected inside heavy bone, the spiral at the bottom is the hearing receptor called the cochlea. The three loops you see above that are three tubes we call semicircular canals and those three tubes determine movement position and acceleration they're tubes filled with a liquid i point out to you that that purple structure is encased in the heaviest bone in the body called the petrous bone that as you can see is inside the ear at the base of the skull 
uh, the semicircular canals are uh, fascinating and, and just another miracle of and wonder of within. But there's fluid inside those three canals, and as the fluid moves back and forth, in the center part there are tiny, tiny little granules that are sitting up on top of little cells that have little hairs on them. So as we change position, the fluid literally moves back and forth. If we stand on our head and twist around and jump and move back and forth, the movement of that fluid wiggles the little granules, which then tickles the little hairs, which then sends nerve messages right up to the brain. So this is pretty amazing that one tiny structure can tell us where we are, which way we're moving, and how fast. So when you stand up on one foot, turn your body a little bit, raise one arm, um, a lot of that position and where your body's going is from the labyrinth. When the labyrinth gets in any kind of trouble, it's called labyrinthitis, and that produces unbelievable vertigo. Um, if you're like um, my inner ear and you get on certain uh, circus rides and state fair rides which I don't do anymore but um, when I spin my labyrinth around when I was 10 12 years old I would be vomiting and so dizzy I had to lay down for an hour so I stopped doing that because my inner ear system could not handle spinning and rapid movement um, to move in the world you've got to know about whether your muscles are tight or loose. Are they ready to fire or not? One thing we do on examination, you've all had this done, um, but I will take a little hammer and I will tap you right below your kneecap. When I tap you, I'm triggering a stretch receptor in the big muscle of your thigh. And when I trigger that stretch receptor, it sends a message in to the spinal cord, that, that blue line, and the blue goes up to the brain, so you know I hit you with the hammer. But notice in the spinal cord, the spinal cord says, I don't like that, and it sends a message right back down the purple line and fires the opposite muscle, and bang, your foot goes out. So we call that a knee reflex, but it really is testing a stretch receptor in the muscles. Um, we need to know how tight our tendons are. Uh, and there's receptors for that that send messages. We need to know our joint position. Uh, is the knee uh, bent or not bent? Is the ankle going to the left or the right? Where is the elbow? Where is the spine? Which way is the pelvis tipped? Now, all of the receptors for joint position, tendon stretch, muscle tightness, all of the messages from the inner ear, that have to do with movement and acceleration. They all flow into a processing center called the cerebellum, which is a lower part of the brain that its main job is to coordinate all of those impulses and produce smooth coordinated movement. So when, uh, when we do this, when we stand on the floor and put ourselves in that position, all of those receptors I mentioned are flowing up into the back part of this man's brain. And what he sees, what he hears, his balance centers, uh, his inner ear reactions, and all of the other receptors simultaneously are being processed so he can make adjustments to maintain his balance. We can make it more difficult. We can put you on a ball and move your body back and forth on the ball. Now you really have to fire up your system. The cerebellum now has 10 times more stimuli and 50 times more work to do to keep you balanced. We can make it even worse. We can put you on a, a half a ball and make you pick things up and move it and lift it. These are training exercises to improve equilibrium and balance, training the entire sensing system to work together in a more coherent, integrated way. Tai Chi is going to be increasingly valuable in the future for seniors.
because it is stimulating muscle stretch receptors, tendon, joint receptors, inner ear, joint position, body position. All of those dynamics are being tested and, and the cerebellum is putting it all together, but it's done in a slow enough way that you're really, really giving time for the systems to learn. And uh, yoga offers other uh, important dynamics. Yoga offers, again, a way to develop uh, this sensing system of how we move in the world, a little more vigorous, a little more stretching, but a way to articulate joints, loosen muscles and tendons, but all the while you're in total control, feeling and being aware, sensing and being aware. And this makes a huge difference that you know exactly what, where you are and what you're doing, which is why we're talking about these senses of awareness. So this is the end of part two, and we've covered how we feel in the world and how we move in the world. Part three is going to look at a few other sensing systems. And I hope you'd enjoyed part two, and I hope you'll go ahead and look at part three. You can leave comments for me um, on this website. There's places for comments. You can email me if you'd like. Uh, email is uh, thewonderwithin at gmail.com. I uh, look forward to any communications. I'd, I'd love some ideas you might have on other areas we can explore together. And um, thank you.